Hey, welcome everyone. I'm David Rammel, editor of Virtualization Cloud Review, and I thank you for attending our Enterprise Storage Backup and Recovery in 2023 Summit, brought to you by Metallic, a Commvault venture, and Avpoint. Before we start today's event, we do have some announcements. First, we wanted to let you know that this event is being recorded and will be available for future viewing. You'll receive an email when the replay is available, generally within the next few days. Also, each of today's three sessions will be followed by a five to 10 minute Q&A. So please be sure to put your questions into the Q&A area of your console as they come up so we can get them answered for you by our experts. And during today's third session, we will be giving away a PlayStation 5, but you must be present to win, so be sure to stay on for the entire event. Finally, we do have resources from our sponsors, Metallic, a Commvault Venture, and Avpoint available on the console right now. So please download and check those out. It's because of our sponsors underwriting this content that we can bring you this event. So we thank them for sponsoring this summit and supporting the community and ask you to check out those resources so we can bring you more sessions in the future. Now on to the first session of today's summit. Expert advice on enterprise storage and backup and recovery for 2023. This session features Greg Schultz, founder and IT analyst at Server Storage IO. Greg has worked as the customer in various IT organizations in different roles, as well as a vendor, consulting analyst, and author of several books, including Software Defined Data Infrastructure Essentials. He brings a diverse background with real world perspective across applications, data infrastructures, hardware, software, and cloud. Greg is a Microsoft MVP Cloud Data Center Management and previous 10 time VMware V expert. Greg, it's great to have you here. Please take it away. Outstanding. Hey, thanks, David. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's summit event. And as David mentioned, I am Greg Schultz, and we are going to talk about expert advice on enterprise storage, backup, and recovery for 2023 and beyond. So part of that is looking forward, so we are going to look a little bit forward. So with that in mind, let's just get right into it and set the big picture. Issues, challenges, opportunities. You know, when I was a customer, we used the phrase problems and things like that. And then when I was the vendor, it was uh, challenges and opportunities. I mean, it's referring to the same thing. And here's what it comes down to, the need for improved storage, backup and recovery, and data protection, which is kind of the big umbrella. Surprise, surprise, there is growth going on here. And what we've got going on is from the core to the edge, on-prem to cloud, IoT, mobile, work from home, more apps, more data, but also the reliance on those being available. Data being retained longer, both the primary data as well as the protection copies, which is overhead we're going to talk about, which is that expanding footprint growth, which we'll also talk about. Um, there is the emergency and legacy threat risk with various impacts, as well as the headline grabber ransomware. And there are the mandates, the requirements, the regulations, as well as continued, um, as continued budget pressure. So what this chart is showing in a, in a, in a summary, the green solid line is the classic data and app growth, okay? And the yellow gold dashed line is showing the relative footprint overhead. In other words, the data, and its protection copies, snapshots, versions, archives, things like that. The solid red line are the increasing threat risks, acts of man, acts of nature, accidental, intentional, software-defined threats, various things, technology failure, um, human error, things like that. But then we also see the budgets either staying flat or, in many cases, declining, while there's that need to support all the growth and defend against these different things. So having looked at that, let's assess the big picture a little bit more here, which is the data infrastructures is there to support the apps and the information services. And there's different layers. 
if we can look at it from the low level infrastructure, infrastructure as a service, whether it's on-prem or cloud, the platform as a service, the tools, technologies that sit between the apps and the infrastructure, and then the various software as a service. And this can include things like O365, Office 365, Salesforce, Box, G Drive, GDoc, Teams, the list goes on and on and on. And some might say, well, geez, we've, we're doing our office in the cloud. We don't have to protect it. We don't have to worry about it. We just have to make sure our credit card has enough uh, balance on it to pay for it. Well, the reality is you should probably be looking at protecting what you have in your Salesforce or in your O365 or other environment. We'll touch more on that as we go. But the, port, the, the theme around this slide is that there are different layers, there are different levels of where different things need to be protected with different granularity and with different focus and in different locations. Everything is not the same. Are you treating everything the same, whether it's that vertical up and down different layers or that horizontal across different locations, platforms, and environments? All right, so it wouldn't be a chat about storage and backup and recovery if we didn't talk about application and data growth. Um, well, let's take it from a different perspective. We always hear about data growth and then insert your favorite superlative, exponential, um, expert, whatever superlative you want to insert into there. But here's the part that we've got to get a better discussion around, okay? And that is, yeah, things are growing, okay? But let's put it in that context of multidimensional. In other words, the volume. There is more copies. There are more data plus there are different copies, which we touched on, which is that overhead. But there is just the sheer volume, the number of items that are out there. And those items, their size is getting bigger. So we have not only more of them, but they're getting bigger. And then we also have to talk velocity speed at which it's created, stored, copy, accessed, moved around. So yeah, surprise, surprise, we've got app and data growth. Uh, they go hand in hand. But again, we've got to pull into this conversation also that aspect of the volume and keep in perspective the size and the velocity. It's a multidimensional problem. It's just not a straight um, linear discussion as has historically been the case. So again, nothing really new here because this whole multi-dimension has been going on for a long time. I mean, we've seen videos going from um, non-high def to 1K uh, high def to 4K ultra high def to 8K to 10K and beyond with faster frame rates and things like that. We're also seeing images getting larger, uh, whether they be a container image, whether it be a uh, uh, operating system or a virtual machine, whatever that happens to be. We're just seeing things in general, their volume, but also the size, the number of them, the size of them, as well as the speed at which they're accessed and dependent upon being available. Okay, so there's another dimension to this, which is um, everything is not the same, so why treat everything the same? And what this means is that, um, oops, sorry there. What this slide should be showing is that there is data with known value, there is data with unknown value, and there's data with no value. And I apologize, it looks like the build here didn't quite complete the way it should have. Um, but that aside is the area in the middle, that blue, think of that as data that has a known value and what's missing is down on the bottom where it says like a sea of data, there's the high value data, which is, you should put that on, high value, high performance storage, i.e. flash, solid state, NVMe, um, whatever is very, very high performance uh, optimized. In the middle is that storage that, ha or that data has some value. It may not be frequently accessed, but you need to retain it Okay, maybe that goes on a different tier of storage, a different category, whether it's on-prem or in the cloud. And also within there is the idea that there is data with unknown value, that it might have future value. Great. Archive it, preserve it, whether it's an active online archive, whether it's offline, whatever. In other words, if you don't know the value of the data yet, 
um, put it somewhere where you've got it, it's protected, but you're not tying up resources every day, every week, every month doing active backups on it if it's not being touched. And the thing to be careful there is it may not be showing up as modified, but is it being read on a regular basis, i.e., you might show that, hey, this data, it hasn't been updated in three years, but yet it's accessed frequently throughout the day. Hmm. You might want to put a copy of that onto a fast cache, a solid state, or something like that. But then there's the data with no value. If the data has no value, you've identified it will never have any more value, um, why are you keeping it? So it's either it has no value, why are you keeping it past a certain time, or it's got value. It could be that, hey, the data's got no value, but for regulatory, we have to keep it. Well, guess what? Then it's got value because the regulatory is saying you have to keep it. But everything is not the same. Why are you treating everything the same? And there's an acronym there, different PACE attributes. PACE is performance, availability, capacity, economics, and management, which we'll uh, look at here as we go in a little bit more. All right, so let's continue our journey. Keep in mind that there's this big picture view of the different threat risks, the things that can happen. Um, it's not if, it's when or where, where um, and so forth. Ransomware gets the headlines. Okay, good. It gets the headlines because then at least it's making people aware. And it's not to downplay ransomware. No, quite the opposite. It's that if, if ransomware is what's needed to get people, uh, to get management, um, higher-ups aware that there's issues out there, great, let's leverage that. The classic saying in uh, disaster recovery, data protection, business continuance, business resilience, backup, restore, archiving, never let a good disaster go to waste. Well, never let that opportunity um, expire without leveraging it to keep in mind there are other threat risks, floods, fires, accidental, intentional, um, somebody just making mistakes. So we can't forget about ransomware, but there are all these other things that can and will happen. And as we look at this a little bit more, there is a denial of service attacks. It could be a virus, a damage, um, accidental, intentional, act of man, act of nature, technology failure, external. But here's what we have to keep in perspective is what are you protecting from, where, when, why, and how, in what situation? Are you treating everything the same? Because if we look at it this way, things could cause a full destruction, either a logical, all your data is corrupted, or physical. Uh, it could be a partial damage. Some things are impacted, some aren't. Your data, your apps might be there, but you just can't get to them uh, for whatever reason. Uh, it could be that you can get to them, but some of the data is missing, that some of it might be corrupted. It might be that um, the data has been exposed. It's not encrypted. Um, it's been compromised. So this is part of looking at it is that there are the different threats, and then what are, how are your different business applications and your data, how are they going to be impacted, what's the likelihood of different scenarios, and do you have to treat everything for a full loss? Well, you should have that as part of your plan, but what if things really aren't changing all that frequently? This comes back to what we're setting up, is a conversation about rethinking how things get used, rethinking how, when, where, why you're protecting, but also how long are you retaining things, how many different versions, how many different copies, and setting up that fast, flexible capability for recovery. Again, we're looking at this from different locations, from out at the edge to uh, on-prem core, cloud, multi-cloud, and again, across different layers. Okay, so as we look at this, here's what's going on, is that you look around, maybe even in your own environment, how things are being done. Well, how are you doing data protection, i.e. backup, recovery, archiving, security, things like that? And what's common is this trap that, it, it, it's a trap that comes down often from the business, from higher ups, um, but yet it puts the business at risk. And what it's really driving it is balancing the relative threat risk and the business impact. It's balancing business enablement versus cost savings. And what I'm showing here is a balancing, and it's that balancing between penny-wise, pound-foolish, 
um, of what's your survival? Are you going to take what's on the right, the classic approach, which is let's avoid cost. Eh, we're not too, we, uh, we, you know, we're going to give lip service to uh, helping out the business impact, but uh, it's not really looking at the lost opportunity and revenue, the cost of disruption, the, the cost of fines, the cost to recover, impact of the brand. It's more looking at how can we just simply cut costs, avoid costs, as opposed to looking over there on the left, a different viewpoint, which is instead of a cost center, instead of a cost overhead, let's think in terms of a survival investment, the business resiliency, the business continues, the business is enabled. It could be revenue positive that rather than cutting costs, you're finding and removing complexity. If you remove complexity, costs are going to follow. So it's looking to remove costs but will enable and make the business um, survivable but also to add other benefits to it as opposed to simply cutting costs. So this is one way to start thinking about it. And again, management will say, well, here, we got to protect but don't spend any money. Well, great. Uh, get, are they willing to sign off on that impact if they say yes? Well, okay, just get them involved. So here's the thing. For Looking at for 2023 and beyond, all right, don't be scared, be prepared, okay? What are the different threat risks? What are the different impacts to your organization, but also to the different apps, the data, the different users? Everything is not the same. You have to treat everything the same. And as a part of that, there are, how are you going to defend against it? You're going to detect, defend, deflect. Um, but what are you going to do when you need when you need to recover? Does it need to be a complete recovery? Can it be just a, a granular of a particular database, a particular table, a particular file system or volume or a particular set of containers? Um, what is it? What's that flexibility that you need? So it's knowing the threat risk. It's being able to defend and, def and um, deter. It's about having education but also leveraging automation, but having that plan and being protected such that when something does happen, you can go back so that as an organization of business, you can go forward. All right, that all sounds good, but let's start digging a little deeper into this. How do we start to make this transition? How do we go from that existing data protection mindset, including backup recovery, understanding where we are to plan where and how to move forward? So. Right off the bat, um, it's buried in here without saying it, is commonly you hear the term backup modernization, data protection modernization. And the normal uh, focus is let's swap out the existing technology, whether it be hardware, whether it's let's get rid of the tape and put disk in, let's get rid of the disk and put solid state in, let's get rid of the solid state and put cloud in. Okay or let's get rid of uh, the current backup software vendor and put somebody new in, or let's swap out this operating system for that, or let's shift from bare metal to virtual ma uh, machine to containers. Okay, that's good, that can help, but you notice the hesitation? And that hesitation is that typically when those quote unquote modernizations are being done, it's carrying forward the previous policies, the previous practices how you're protecting, what you're protecting, what granularity. Are you just simply grabbing everything and just moving it from one medium to another? Are you just taking one piece of software and using it the same way? So what this sets up is a conversation around start using new things in new ways. Start using new and old things in new ways versus simply using the cloud as that target how you've always backed up to or how you've always replicated to. Start rethinking things. Start rethinking um, that speed of recovery versus the speed of production. Instead of throwing more hardware at the problem to get the backups done quicker, why not think about and say, why are we moving all that data? Most of it's not changing. Um, do we have to copy it all every day? Or can we start doing some different things at different granularities, at different intervals, and at different layers? So this is part of that rethinking. What to protect against what, when, where, and with the focus on recovery, with that flexibility to speed up the recovery. Okay, 
that all sounds great, but how do we do it? Well, here's a visual way of looking at it. This is just a, uh, a visualization of what I was talking through before, which is there's all these things that are coming in from the left, whether they be threat risk, service objectives, the different tools, the technologies, uh, the different techniques, the different trends. All those are coming in, and we see there in the gold where the common, current, and traditional um, thinking has been. We need to jump over there on that right. Again, that focus on enablement, that focus on supporting the growth, removing costs, enabling faster recovery, reducing risk. Again, everything is not the same. Why is it being treated the same? Okay, so here are some of the different pieces that come into mind, which is I don't I want to be careful about saying protect anything from anywhere. To, we want to be able to protect at different layers. We want to protect at the application layer, in between, at that middleware, that uh, pass layer, as well as at that infrastructure with different granularity. And this is where we start to bring in the different tools. And this is start to get into that conversation, what to use, when, where, why, and how. Where's the big red easy button that just says, hey, Tell me how to do it, and I'll push the button so it gets done. Well, ask your uh, solution providers about that. But it's also understanding what are your workloads, what are your apps, what are their characteristics, but also what is the business expectation. If the business says, yeah, you know what, we don't need fast recovery, we don't need um, zero data loss, we just need to do it as cheap as possible. Hey, if that's what the business is mandating, that's what – you know, that's a business decision. But get the business to make that decision as opposed to um, you as an IT practitioner. You want the business involved in it. But also, there is that in that race to cut costs, are applications suffering? Are they exposed? Are, is their performance being impacted? So that's part of that bigger picture. And then as that's understood, now it becomes a mapping exercise of, where to use these different tools, these different technologies, these different techniques, such that you've got how things are protected in different ways and at different intervals and granularity, that now you can start to have flexibility on that recovery, whether it's on-site, to a cloud, multi-cloud, to a peer location, and at what level, at what granularity. Key at all that is having insight awareness. So I mentioned service objectives here, and I just want to touch on this real quickly, is again, there's service level objective, SLOs, but this really sets up to what are your recovery time objectives, your RTO or uh, RTOs, what are your recovery point objectives, RPOs, um, your mean time to repair, uh, different things like that. But this is looking beyond the IT and the tech to how the IT and tech gets used based on what the business needs and wants. And that's a key one, needs versus wants. Needs require funding. Wants are wish list. If somebody says, I want this, great. Do they have the budget? Do they have that capability? But are they also aware of what the impact, pro or con are, for um, wanting um, a instantaneous recovery that they may or may not need? Do they know that cost? Likewise, if they say, well, you know what, we really don't need instantaneous because i got to protect my budget, are they aware of that impact? So it's understanding those both sides to it. Again, it's not just about – it's moving beyond a cost-cutting exercise. So, again, just getting different stakeholders involved. And here's the thing is avoid flying blind, having that insight. Um, everything is not the same. Why treat it the same? And the key thing here I want to mention – about recovery times, recovery points, is watch out for is the focus on the component or is it a compound holistic? I'll give you a quick example. The component might be an RTO, recovery time objective for storage or for a database or file system, um, as opposed to a compound, which is the collection of the storage, the file system, the database, the app, um, everything collectively, the network, in other words, when the user is able to start doing work again, both not just reading or running queries, but actually doing updates. So it's important to keep those in mind when you're talking about RTOs, uh, RPOs, recovery point objectives, um, availability, durability, different things like that. 
is there's the component, but then there's that holistic, that compound, that end-to-end. -end. All right. So the other thing that I mentioned here, touched on this a, a little bit ago, is that the different layers, the different altitudes, and that are you protecting everything the same? In other words, are you just simply protecting from the storage system, or are you protecting everything at the application level? Are you relying on database replication to uh, do everything? or the virtual machine to do its snapshots or some points in between? What about the cloud? Are you just simply relying on um, the cloud-based uh, protection of, for example, a volume or a file system? And what this is setting up is just that reminder is that there's different granularity, there's different contexts, there's different consistency, which means we have to protect. We have to be aware of protecting at different layers. And the discussion should not be if the discussion should not be, well, application replication versus database replication versus file system versus storage versus virtual machine, okay? The conversation should be is how can you leverage those without adding complexity, but how can you leverage those to be complementary versus being positioned for competitive? So it's that rethinking what to do where and how can you facilitate the recovery higher up that stack in a more granular fo uh, fashion. All right, so this kind of builds on that previous theme, which is what are you protecting and how are you protecting at different layers? And whether it be a monolithic uh, traditional approach or we could change this diagram a little bit and it could be more of a cloud native, move some of the things around, but where are you doing the protection where are you doing that resilience, that recovery capability at different layers? Um, and again, is it what went offline? What was impacted? That's part of that understanding of that maybe the product catalog is offline or there's a problem with that. Is everything else okay? Well, do we need to recover everything or is it a matter of just bringing back what's involved to support the product catalog? Okay, again, this is that rethinking that re-architecting how and what things get protect against the different threat risks. All right, so let's all go to the cloud. Let's all go to the cloud and everything will be taken care of for us, okay? What happens when the cloud either goes offline, is not available, not accessible? Yeah, it happened, what, a week ago? Uh, Azure had a big outage. We've seen it with all the different providers that they have different level of disruptions, different things. Um, and the key there is following the different cloud providers' best practices, their recommendations on how to work things, how to configure, um, and also adding your own protection. So in other words, if you got something in O365, are you able to have a copy of that and bring it back on site or to move it elsewhere if need be? You got an application running in AWS and you've got it running in different regions, different availability zones. Um, yeah, you've got a lot of durability there. And keep in mind that availability is the sum of accessibility plus durable. In other words, the data, the apps are durable, they're there, uh, plus they're accessible. If you don't have access, well, you don't have availability. If you got availability but your durability is impacted your availability. So it's some of those parts. So you can have your replica copies, and again, are you going to have everything protected the same way? Uh, that's part of that rethinking. And it's also how you can start your uh, transition to address some of the budget concerns that are out there. Okay? So enabling tools, technology. Well, using new and old things in new ways in different ways. So there's, what I've got here are five big buckets. There's data storage solutions. There's data footprint reduction. There's space saving point in time copies, virtualization containers cloud, as well as automation, AI, intelligent management, insight awareness, i.e. management tools. You might be saying, well, wait a minute, where's DDU? Wait a minute, what about archiving? Hey, where's solid state? What about NVMe? Uh, well, let's get into it here. So key, everything is not the same, different tiers of storage systems, platforms, media, mediums, protocols, and attributes, pace. There it is again. 
performance, availability, capacity, economics, and management. By performance, I, need, I mean I.O. throughput, number of I.O. or uh, operations or transactions, latency, response time. Um, availability is, is it available? Is it accessible? Is it durable? Um, can you get to it? And uh, do you have that capacity? Is it secured? Uh, the economics, certainly that cost aspect to it. So there's different pieces to it. Data footprint reduction are the different tools and technologies that help you to reduce that overhead of storing not only the data, but also to reduce the size of the data itself. In other words, to allow you to store more data with more copies, more versions longer. We'll go into what that includes here in a moment. Space saving snapshots actually could be part of data footprint reduction, but we just got them there to highlight that need for more intervals uh, with less overhead. Virtualization containers, part of this is protecting what's virtualized and in containers and they're in clouds, uh, but also to be able to leverage those as part of recovery mechanisms, whether it's that's where you're going to recover to, that's where you've got a uh, test and development uh, a sandbox, lab environment for training, um, all the above. And then, of course, the different tools. So let's go into this a little bit more. All right. So different storage solutions. There's legacy TINRAP software, i.e., software that's deployed on a server with storage attached that uh, is touted as so software-defined storage, but yet it's all bundled as a appliance. In other words, it's wrapped with TIN. Okay. Software-defined storage could also be here. I'm going to download this software and run it on my own server, um, or I'm going to run it on the cloud. Okay. It's just different instantiations, different ways of packaging at the edge, at the core, on-prem, and to support different applications with different pace attributes. Uh, there's from bare metal, physical machine, to cloud, virtual machine containers, um, as well as different application-aware, application-focused. You know, with storage, there's the conversations of, well, what is it? Is it high performance? Is it uh, object? A lot of times the conversations tend to be around the medium, i.e., solid state or hard drives or tape, or the protocols to access it, NVMe, uh, block or file, F NFS, uh, SMB, um, or object, S3, or some of the other uh, proprietary objects. But there's the other side, uh, you know, another uh, description is that of table. What's a table store? A database. Um, it can be accessed as a service. But something else about that is storage has different personalities. Yeah, it's got a protocol. Yeah, it uh, has different mediums and different capabilities. But it can also have different personalities, i.e., it's optimized for throughput or it's optimized for uh, low latency, it's optimized for IOPS for transactions, it's optimized for low performance, high capacity, low cost, and different peers, different types. And then there are the different attributes, different capabilities with security, encryption, immutability, management, and then the list goes on and on and on. All right, so data footprint reduction, there's a lot going on here. And there are the tools, the metrics, you know, what's your uh, compression ratio? What's your dedupe ratio? And there's a lot of focus around ratios because they can be impressive. But the other part that has to be in context is what's your rate? It's one thing to say I can get a 10 to 1 compression or a 10 to 1 dedupe or 20 to 1 or whatever it happens to be. But what's the rate at which it can be accessed, reinflated, moved? So, it's more than just ratios, it's also the rates that what things can be done. Archiving, boy, if there is aspirin for most IT data storage, backup recovery challenges, headaches, that, archi that aspirin, it's called archiving, life beyond compliance, long-term and active as well as inactive uh, archives. Just get the data protected somewhere and it could be just at a longer interval. But the whole idea is why are you protecting all that data that might be inactive um, the same way? Just rethink it. Backup recovery modernization, again, as we touched on, more than just swapping out one tech to a new tech. It's start rethinking 
how you're going to use it when and where. Leveraging compaction, compression, along with data compression, uh, cleanup, and dedupe at the system level, at the server, at the file system, at the storage, along with at the network. Because especially if you're moving things to the cloud, you want to reduce how much of that data is going over that network to go into the cloud because it might be free going in. When you got to pull it out, one, there is the cost, but there's also that speed of which you're going to be able to get the data back. Some other things, which these also dovetail with storage capabilities. It's in provisioning, tiered storage, storage tiering, um, space-saving snapshots give you those intervals with a smaller footprint, along with different RAID hardware software, including mirroring, parity, erasure codes, um, LRCs, among others. All right, real quickly, I want to talk about gaps. There's good gaps, there's bad gaps, there's ugly. Good gaps are air gaps. Good gaps are time gaps, uh, where there's a gap between a protection interval, i.e., an RPO, recovery point. There is a gap between an online copy and an offline copy, an air gap for uh, protection. The bad are missed recovery points, gaps in time, gaps in coverage. Something wasn't protected. Hey, backups ran in a record time last night. Um, guess what? No data was moved. There was a problem. There's a gap in coverage or a gap in consistency. Yeah, things are protected. Yeah, we got multiple copies of it, but they're all corrupt. Well, identifying that, having that insight, the tools to help give you, you got good coverage or not, um, what is the health of it, trust yet verify. The ugly, recovery gaps. What you thought was recoverable, it's not. It's not there. It wasn't grabbed. It wasn't copied. It wasn't protected. So we have to keep these different gaps in mind. And again, part of this is how we're transitioning. And part of this is using new and old things in new ways and leveraging space-saving snapshots so we can have more intervals, more not just copies, but intervals. We want to be able to have our multiple copies of different versions on different devices along with air gaps, including off-site. Um, and the whole idea is that we want these so that they have a lower overhead but that we've got that flexibility for rapid recovery, for flexibility recovery. If we only need to bring back a snapshot or a checkpoint, a consistency point for a particular table, do we need to worry about bringing the entire application back or not? Okay, so this is what gives us an enabling smart, flexible backup with different approaches. And again, um, you could call these different things. It could be evolving from old school three, two, one, multiple copies in different locations, at least one of them off-site, to what I refer to as a four, three, two, one, just keep it simple, which is emphasis on copies, but also emphasis on versions, as well as in the different devices and the locations, including at least one or more off-site, offline air gap. All right, so real quickly here, just putting a little bit more focus around the interval. And what we're looking at here on these intervals is, um, as we looked at early on, we have to keep in perspective that things get done at different levels, at different layers. And that you could be running snapshots very, very frequently, um, whether it's 15 minute, hourly, every eight hours, and whether these are snapshots or actual copies, these are all your point in time, your, your version, whether it be a snapshot, a regular backup, um, consistency point. And these can also be done at the different layers. You've got the coarse layers being done at the storage. Um, you've got different granularities that could be done. Um, you could be doing database replication checkpoints for failover. The whole thing here is these are all in your, your toolbox. These are tools, technologies that are in your toolbox for rethinking. And the trick is balancing between the business needs, the different impacts, not treating everything the same, but doing so that you're removing complexity versus adding. And that's where the, the, the trick comes in. It's part science, part art, um, part experience, but that's also where um, your your 
value resellers, your partners can come in to help you walk through this rather than just simply trying to sell you a new piece of hardware or a new piece of software. They can bring their expertise in to help you rethink things for near term, for down the road, for longer term that you can evolve to it. Uh, the key is just start rethinking things. What's going to happen? What are the threats? And how do you enable that fast, flexible recovery? All right. So I mentioned other tools. Yeah, automation, AI, management insight. The key is avoid flying blind. Have timely, accurate awareness of what you have. Is your data protection working? Do you have coverage gaps or gaps in coverage? Can you restore and actually use what is protected? Uh, do you have visibility into how resources used along with service delivery? And, um, you know, it's trust, your, trust the protection, but verify it. And when I say, can you restore it, that means more than just simply, here, I'm going to bring a copy of the data back, and, yep, it worked. Okay, you got to go one step further is have somebody actually use that data with their app, with their database, whatever it happens to be, to verify that, yes, in fact, it is working. Automate common recurring tasks. Automation AI is only as good as the policies and the data they receive to act on, garbage in, garbage out. So if they got good data, good actionable policies, they can really help. And remember to also protect your data protection and management environment for when something happens. All right, let's wrap up. We get into some questions here. Um, everything is not the same, so why treat it the same? Gain and maintain that situational awareness. Know your biz apps, your workloads, your technology. You're an orchestrator between the business needs, the, the business demands, your tools, your technology. You're going to orchestrate those based on the um, criteria of others. The best solution is the one that works for you, not the one that you have to work for. And just keep the different layers in perspective along with trust, yet verify your data protection. Uh, practice, train, but don't cause a disaster. Anywhere, where you can learn more, my site, storageioblog.com, my different books. I'm on Twitter at StorageIO. There's my email, Greg at StorageIO. And with that, David, are we ready to go into some Q&A? Yes, we are, Greg. We have some questions lined up. Great job on the presentation, by the way. And before we get to the questions, I'd like to remind the audience that we can take questions up until about five minutes up to – to the top of the hour in order to give you a short break before the next session. So please send them on in now. And let's get to the Q&A box. We'll just go first come, first serve. First question reads, is there still a role or place for on-premises storage and backup? Absolutely. Um, it's a common question that comes up. And, um, the caveat to that, David, it's easier to say when is it not applicable. It's actually easier saying it that way. Real simple. If you no longer have any data need to be on-prem, if you no longer have any storage on on-prem, then you probably don't need to have protection on-prem or to protect uh, the on-prem. I mean, that then all of a sudden uh, eliminates it or can. You still may want to have a copy of pulling something back uh, from O365 or Salesforce to your on-prem just so you have it. Um, but unless you have moved everything away from on-prem or even from the edge, you still, need to, uh, you still need to protect it. That makes sense. Let's move to the next question. It reads, why backup clouds? They are already highly available. Yeah, that's another popular one, and it's real simple, which is um, the clouds have lots of capabilities and lots of good uh, direction on what to do, what not to do. And what it really comes down to is giving you more granularity, more flexibility, um, particularly to be able to restore to another cloud. So if you're taking a standpoint is, yeah, we want to be in the cloud, but we don't want any single points of failure. The business is willing to pay for it. They realize the benefit. Great. Then you want to have that capability of supplementing, not necessarily replacing, but supplementing, complementing what's there in the cloud so that you can have a copy somewhere else or that you can recover somewhere else. 
Okay, great. Next question. What does using new and old things in new ways mean? Can you revisit that? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's one of those where um, it's one of those that you know, I mention all the time. But you know, a classic example is you know, I touched on. Um, we're going to get rid of tape. Why? Because our restores fail. Okay, great. Put hard drives in. It's like you know what? We got to get rid of hard drives because they're too slow, and we're still having failure. Okay, let's put solid state in. Um, yeah, it's faster, but you know we're still having issues with restores. Hmm. Is the problem with restores with the technology and the tools that you keep swapping out, or could it be that there's something else wrong? So part of it is you know changing things. Part of it is rather than just simply protecting everything in the same way, but using new tech or tools, rethink how you're going to protect. Let's archive a bunch of it off to uh, disk or tape, or put it to the cloud where the uh, the disk and tape are hidden. Um, we think that a little bit so that what you're saving to solid state, you don't need as much, but you're able to use it more effectively. Okay, great. I'd like to remind the audience to please send in any questions you have because Greg lives and breathes this stuff. So this is a great opportunity for someone to get some expert one-on-one -on -one discourse. So send those questions on in, please. You know, David, just to build on that last one um, is uh, think of it this way. Your recovery mechanism should be so flexible, so fast, that you can get out of trouble faster than you got yourself into it. <laughs> okay. I find that in my own personal life, too. All <laughs> right. <laughs> so... You mentioned HDD and tape. What's the deal with those? I thought those were dead. Nobody's using them, are they? Yeah, they've been on the zombie technology list for decades. And the zombie technology list is anything that's declared dead because something new and emerging has killed them off. Well, okay, good. Tape is still very much around. It's being used in different ways. There's the key thing. It's rare that you see somebody backing up to tape. Instead, it's there for that archive or as that tertiary copy. And more commonly, where the tape is now, it's, it's at the clouds, but it's, it's abstracted behind different services where it may not be clear. Are you going to disk or are you going to tape? Um, it's abstracted. So part of that is using those older technologies in a new way. Um, I don't want to be spinning up and running my VMs or uh, containers or even just regular workload on a hard drive. I did it the other day by accident. It was like ugly. Um, I want those all on fast medium, and I want to be able to snapshot them quickly. But then after that snapshot, that protection copy is made, they can triple off, trickle off to a slower hard drive that's got a higher capacity or trickle off uh, to the cloud. Okay. Now let's turn to the hottest topic in the IT industry today. How does AI help improve storage, backup, and recovery? In other words, can I just ask Chat GPT to set up my storage, backup, and recovery? Will that work? Well, I've been hesitant to do that just because I'm scared of what it's going to say. Uh, but I probably should see that uh, just to see what its response is. Um, and I'm chuckling for a reason, is that there is a play for it. In automation, whether you want to call it AI or machine learning or um, whatever you want to refer to it as, um, it's great for handling those common things. Um, if you can use your AI to go out and say, hey, you know what, you've got coverage gaps, or you know what, uh, yeah, you're doing all this protection, but, geez, you've got all this extra overhead out there that if you were to do this, um, it could be uh, more effective. And we've had these tools, we've had these technologies uh, in the past, uh, and not just for years. They just haven't been called AI enabled. So um, always interacting, always uh, uh, interacting with AI is entertaining. Yes, it is. I should have had Chat GPT fired up here, and I could have ask that question and have a live demo for the audience. How do you do storage backup and recovery? 
is um, ask it, what's more important, backup or recovery? That's a good one. Yeah. Sounds like an article in the making. Okay. I think it is. <laughs> All right. So it looks like we've only got one more question in the Q&A box. So audience members, please send them on in, or we'll just answer this question and wrap up a few minutes early. So, Greg, is DFR or data reduction an alternative to using dedupe? Great question, and the answer is dedupe is part of data footprint reduction. Data footprint reduction embraces and includes dedupe. And the theme here, the important message is don't become tunnel vision on just one tool, one technology, whether it be archive or compression or dedupe or thin provisioning. Don't become tunnel vision. There's all these different capabilities, and they can be done in different places. Look at how you can best leverage them to address the bigger picture. Sounds good. Okay, that's a wrap on the question. So thanks again, Greg, for an excellent presentation and answering all of those audience questions. No worries. My pleasure. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the second session of the Enterprise Storage Backup and Recovery heading into 2023 Summit, organized by the hardworking folks at Redmond Magazine, AWS Insider, and Virtualization and Cloud Review, who have brought together some of the very best independent experts on today's topic. Many thanks to our sponsors, Metallic, a Commvault venture, provider of enterprise-grade backup solutions, and Avpoint, provider of an advanced platform for SaaS and data management. Without them, this event would not be possible. And thanks to you for joining us. I'm John K. Waters, Editor-in-Chief of the Converge 360 Group of 1105 Media, and I'll be your moderator for the second of our three information-packed sessions. But before we get started, just a really quick reminder, each of today's sessions is being recorded for later access. Keep an eye out for an email with a link to that recording. It'll be coming your way within the next few days. Each of today's sessions will be followed by a five to 10 minute Q&A. You can type your questions into the Q&A box at any time. Please feel free to add your questions as they occur to you throughout the summit. We'll do our best to get to all of them. Uh, our sponsors have provided some extra resources you should check out that can be found on the right-hand side of your screen. And at the end of this summit, you'll be asked to take a really short survey. Please take just a moment to share your honest opinions. Our editors actually read every comment. I'm one of them, so I know it's true. Your opinions help to shape our future events. And last but not least, at the end of the third session, one lucky attendee will be receiving a PlayStation 5 lightning fast loading with an ultra high speed SSD, haptic feedback, adaptive triggers, 3D audio, and an all new generation of games but you must be present to win, so stay tuned. Now let's get to uh, get started with our second session and it's uh, entitled Top Best Practices for Storage, Backup and Recovery for 2023. And for this session, we called on Dave Kawula, Managing Principal Consultant at Tricon Elite Consulting and Tricon's president, Crystal Kalua. Um, Dave, uh, Dave is a Microsoft MVP with more than 20 years of experience in the IT industry. His background includes data communications networks uh, within multi-server environments, and he has led architecture teams for virtualization, system center, exchange, active directory, and internet gateways. Also an MVP, Crystal manages the day-to-day -day operations of the field consulting and sales teams at Tricon. Early in her career, she worked as a consultant with Microsoft, authoring content for internal SMSGR and GTR teams, uh, which was uh, used to train internal support engineers and global escalation engineering teams. She's the co-founder of, of the MP, uh, MVP Days Community Roadshow, he tried to say, and the hashtag MVP Hour live Twitter chat. She's only the second woman in the world to receive the Veeam Vanguard Community Excellence Award, and she recently helped publish a book for other women MVPs called Voices from the Data Platform. You guys are in for such a great session. Take it away, Dave and Crystal. Well, thanks for having us, John, and uh, to all of our attendees, welcome to the second session here. Crystal and I are so pleased to be able to uh, present these. As always, just a little bit of housekeeping. We love to make our sessions interactive. So as we're going through any of the topics, if you have any questions, 
feel free to type them into the Q&A panel. We like to do them um, live as we go through the show, like to make it a little more interactive like that. So, Crystal, are you excited to be presenting here today? I am, I am. This is, uh, I think, my second one of these that I've gotten to do, both times getting, uh, honestly, a little thrown in the fire, filling in for John. Um, but uh, I'm ready, and I'm ready to... Uh, Let's rock a session here. Awesome. And the John that she is referring to is Mr. John O'Neill Sr., the, the, my famous co-presenter. He is unfortunately uh, indisposed. He's flying through the air right now. And if he had a way to dial into these things from the plane, he would probably figure it out. But uh, we're, we've got a great fill-in with yourself, Crystal, so let's get going here. Um, our first topic, and, you know, we're talking a little bit about enterprise uh, backup and recovery in 2023 here. And uh, I had to put this slide in. And the reason that I did is that we go through this process of wanting to protect our most critical assets, our, you know, our prized gems that we have inside of our infrastructure that run payroll, that run plant floor operations, that run financial services. And we often forget that there's a cost to protecting that infrastructure. And so earlier this week, we actually went through a scenario where we were going through some decommissioning of old servers. And interestingly enough, one of them, as part of the story goes, um, was around a terabyte in size. It was a virtual machine around terabyte size. And you think, well, okay, well, that's pretty good. You just saved yourself uh, a terabyte of storage on your, you know, your primary hyper-converged infrastructure, you know, that's not cheap infrastructure to put in in the first place. But also, you're saving a quantifiable amount of money and space on all of the backup targets and cloud storage as well, because typically, we want to back up our infrastructure. We want to have multiple copies of that infrastructure in case the backup targets fail. So traditionally, we'll have at least two copies, maybe three copies of backups. So now that one terabyte just became three. And if we want DR, now we're going to have a couple more copies of that. So quickly, you could be up to a 5x multiplier. So we actually just removed in this customer scenario almost six terabytes of data by just cleaning up that infrastructure. So, Crystal, is this an important thing to think about for organizations as they're planning their backup and recovery strategies for 2023? It's not only just add, add, add. It's also cleaning up. Absolutely. As, as for me, especially the mom and me always wants to save everything. Um, but the fact is we don't need to be keeping those legacy systems around. I do know a lot of IT guys are like, well, what if I need that system? What if I need something off of that? What if I need this? What if I need that? To a point, there is something to be said for keeping your old data, but you need to really take a hard look at it. Take a look at what's important, what's not, and what is that uh, method they say? If it hasn't been important to you or doesn't bring you joy, get rid of it. Yep. It costs hard money. Like it costs money to keep all these backups. Keep the data you need. Keep the data that, um, I mean, you can cold storage stuff that you may need, but you really have to take a really deep look at what you're storing and decide if it's necessary to your organization anymore and consolidate what you can. Absolutely. And, and along that, along those, those lines, just to kind of further that point, um, I often get called into organizations, Crystal, that are migrating around infrastructure. And, you know, one of the, my least favorite things to put on super fast, all flash storage is giant file servers. You know, the cost per gigabyte and terabyte on all flash infrastructure, when I have parked data that's sitting on there, is astronomical. Because you look at how much that data actually gets accessed. So another one of the recommendations that I have moving into 2023 for my customers in regards to their backup and recovery strategy is to consider taking those file servers, servers and tiering that data up to the cloud have your hot data potentially on-prem and archive, archive, archive. Because if it's not being accessed, you know, it's probably okay that it gets recalled a few seconds later as we take and seed it back into the 
on-prem infrastructure. And there's good technologies out there like that can help us with that, like you know Azure files and and things like that to try to move some of those file servers up to the cloud. Because you know I have one that I'm looking at actually today. It's <laughs> it's a it's a nine terabyte file server that consumes over 40% of the storage on my hyper-converged appliance, one VM. And mm -hmm. so now you take that nine terabytes with the 5X multiplier, I'm like 45 terabytes just to protect that thing. Whereas if I can tear that up to the cloud, those like we're, we were talking about are just, they're real hard savings that you can get. And it's a very beneficial pro project for 2023. What a great lead into tearing up to the cloud, Dave. Right? And there, and, <laughs> And there, and there, there we go, tiering up to the cloud. And so for your tiering up to the cloud, as I mentioned earlier, um, you want to look at that for your file servers, your core file servers. But you can also look at that for your backup targets as well because backup targets are typically just large block-based appliances that provide a lot of storage for us, right? Because nothing consumes storage faster in infrastructure, in my opinion, than backups or replicas. That is going to consume a lot of space real fast. And if we can start to conserve some of that space by pushing some of those replica copies, you know, you might have policies in your organization where you've got data retention requirements where, you know, you might need one year, three year, five year, 20 years of, of copies of that. Maybe you need infinite copies of that data going up. Well, you don't really want to be storing all of that on-prem. So the cloud becomes a very good place for that because blob storage in the cloud is a lot cheaper than you t taking and building your own storage um, on-prem in, in the long term. Um, one of the other recommendations that I have with this, especially if you're using something like Microsoft Azure for that blob storage, be very, very careful when you're creating those storage accounts because there's different sets of uh, availability that you can have. And so I can have local redundancy, I can have geo redundancy, zone redundancy, and the absolute cheapest is local redundancy where we'll have three copies of that data in the same data center. Um, if you start going geo, which is typically by default, um, your price per gig goes up substantially. So if you want that quick cost savings, you can get that by adjusting your uh, blob storage accounts. So just make sure that those are set up properly. And the second thing is when you set up those blob storage accounts um, or cloud-based storage accounts, make sure that you're locking those down so that they're just not open-ended to uh, public endpoints. You want to lock those down to specific IP ranges to ensure that you're not going to be compromised by a threat actor trying to take advantage of you. And when you're looking at tiering, you kind of look at most important equals fastest equals most expensive, right? So you're going to look at, you're going to give your most important data the fastest access, but it recognizes it's going to cost the most as well. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And, and most of the modern um, backup providers that are out there, either the, the OS native ones like Microsoft or your third party vendors, are providing pretty good scale up solutions to the clouds. And, and I've even had organizations tier up to multiple clouds because you know maybe, maybe Amazon's giving a better price point than what Microsoft is. And they like some of the immutability settings that are inside of AWS over what Microsoft is giving you. And so from my perspective, it's kind of dealer's choice. I, I don't really care where you choose to park that data. It's just for me, when we have an emergency and we need to recover that data and we need to restore it, I don't really care where it comes from. I just need to make sure that I can get it back and that it is available for me as expected per the design. So maybe test access? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, don't just throw all your data up there without testing it. What a great point. Make sure that you're actually going through and testing those backups and, and documenting that process. All right. Next one here. We'll cover the lake. All right. Your <laughs> right. So this is one of the ones that I often see. I talk to customers and um, the backup infrastructure for me, for a lot of organizations, Crystal tends to be a set it and forget it. You know, you build these backup targets. Is anybody actually logging into those things to see if there's dead drives? Like, do we have alerting set up through you know, the, the out-of-band management interfaces on those things. 
do we know if a memory chip has died in it? Do we know if, you know, a CPU is going? Do we know if they're overheating? You know, from, from that perspective, from recoverability, you know, at the hardware layer for when we're building this out on-prem, um, you need to make sure that you give the appropriate amount of care and feeding. And I, this, this, I'm going to say this comes from experience. Like we, how often is it that we go into a client in an emergency situation and we find out, oh, nobody's been checking those backups. Oh, we've had a dead drive on there for how long? It, it's not, you know, just a, just a, a set it and forget it and let's hope for the best. It, it's literally something that we run into quite frequently where people just aren't giving that care and attention to their backups. Yeah, and, and I think that prior to, you know, having gone through the new world of cyber attacks, state-sponsored attacks, you know, you know, cyber warfare, things like that, I don't think we really paid a lot of attention to this hardware. You know, often cases we would use we, we would use recycled hardware. We would be, you know, okay, well, you no, know, that file server's done, but it still has a lot of life as a backup target. It's been on, it's been on the network for sixty months or five years here. Let's get another five years out of that. We're going to run this till it dies. Well, that's fine, but in the event that you really need that data back and you're having some type of catastrophic hardware failure that now you can't even phone the vendor for support, that's very problematic. The second thing that's very problematic with all of this and using old hardware for these backup targets and needing to be able to recover is you can have longstanding impacts on your cyber insurance policies. So there's new um, verbiage that's written into a lot of those contracts that are being um, laid down in front of customers here in 2023. And those, the, what's happening in there is they're actually putting riders that if you have out-of-support hardware and end-of-life infrastructure at a hardware level, there's potential riders on there that you're not going to have coverage because part of your cyber recovery defense and sustainability um, responsibilities as an organization is to make sure that if you build this, that it actually works, not, oh, I'm just going to try this out in the emergency. So I'm treating DR, I'm treating backup environments, Crystal, almost more production than production. Because in the event that something does happen and you need to get that data back right now, it's heaven your forbid one. your organization hit the news and you're the new victim of a ransomware attack, um, you need to get that back. So now you realize when the bosses come to you and they say, oh, well, we didn't know, you didn't tell us that we needed to spend more money on the recovery environment. You should have explained this more thoroughly. We would have cut whatever checks are necessary to make sure that we've got a viable backup and DR env uh, environment that's built out for us. You know, how many times I've heard that story, Crystal? Oh, yes, the would have, could have, and should have of management. Well, had you just made it clear to us, we would have had that covered for you. Um, make it clear, guys. Like, get it, get that in front of your management right now. That that backup, that's your lifeline. It is as important, if not more important, because that's where all your long-term data is going to be as well. All that stuff that you're going to have to roll back to, all those checkpoints that you're going to need to rebuild should something happen to your production environment. This is your production environment too. Yeah, and, and one of the things I recommend um, for organizations and individuals for this year is that, you know, we go through a lot of exercises, Crystal, from uh, a cyber defense perspective. And so, you know, part of that cyber defense in my mind is the ability to recover. So we are breached. Um, we've had a hardware failure. I don't care what it is. Recoverability for me is the ability to take and bring something back online when something fails for whatever reason. So we do exercises from a cyber perspective called red teaming and blue teaming. You know, red teaming, it's red, red team is going to be the attackers, blue team is going to be the defenders. Well, I think you also have to build inside of there a DR and recovery team exercise as well. Because um, what happens if, you know, this site is no longer available? What happens if that cloud platform that you're on is no longer available? What happens if your network? 
is no longer available. Right. And so, you know, your connectivity to the cloud, your hybrid interfaces inside of this, you have to simulate what that looks like if any of those plugs are pulled and what type of impact that's going to have on your application. For example, we love to move um, a lot of our authentication pieces up to Azure Active Directory right now. We like to set up single sign-on for a lot of these pieces. Well, what happens if there's something wrong in your cloud provider and we have something that goes bump in the night and all of a sudden our single sign-on is not working? Well, is that a critical application? Do we have an alternative to get in? Is that impacting customers? Can they retrieve their statements or orders online? Like, what does this look like? But and the cloud never goes down. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, well, the, the thing is that the cloud runs on the same um, on-prem uh, on infrastructure, just at greater scale managed by somebody else. I just, okay. like, I just like to look at the cloud this way, Crystal. It's kind of like, you know, instead of you having to run into the data center and do things, um, it's kind of like you just taking and throwing your keys at somebody and saying, okay, you be the driver now. I don't need to drive anymore. I'll just, <laughs> I will I will just sit here and watch from a distance as you take care of everything. And it's actually a good out for us in IT as well because how many times have we had an Office 365 outage or an Outlook outage or something like that, um, something that's cloud related, and I just go back to the bosses and say, well, there's not really much we can do. I can press the F5 refresh button on the status page, and when it goes green, we should be okay. And that's kind of, you know, say la vie, that's kind of the, the life of, of cloud and hybrid infrastructure. Um, one more piece to recoverability though, Crystal, um, please do make sure that you test how long it takes to get your data back. Because if you're deep inside of an archive tier that's in the cloud, that data could potentially have to be rehydrated at a point in time before you gain access to it. And so if that is the case and you have to go through something like that, you need to plan accordingly. But a lot of the cloud vendors, um, they actually have options that they can potentially. I was just going to say, know your escalation path, yeah. right? Um, in an emergency, many of the vendors have options to escalate getting your data back. But you need to know how to leverage those options. You need to know who to call, when to call, what to ask for. You need to have that in your playbook so that you know what to do should you need to get at that data. Well, and then when it comes terms to recoverability, don't be scared to make those phone calls in advance and talk to your vendors and say, hypothetically speaking, this is my scenario. What would this look like? Do I have the right escalation path? Do I have the right phone numbers? Maybe there's a bump up in speed they could give you. You don't know until you make that phone call. I'm going to say too, you can even go one step further you can put your vendors in the hot seat when choosing your cloud providers as well. Be prepared to ask those questions in an emergency. Who is it? Whose responsibility is it to get access to that data? How do you get access to that data? What is the ex expected recovery times on X amount of data? These are all things you can ask when choosing your cloud provider, not get it all in there and then figure out the details after. Absolutely. All right, so one of the other pieces here um, when we look at protecting our infrastructure. So almost 100% of customers that I deal with today, uh, Crystal, have some type of hybrid infrastructure. I have very few that are on the full um, cloud side where everything is cloud, and I have very few that are still just 100% on-prem. There's some portion of hybrid that's inside of there and um, one of the things that I like to look at is that what are the options that my cloud native providers are giving me versus the third party uh, backup utilities that we would use on-prem? Because a lot of those do have cloud-based tooling as well, so you can get that single pane of glass interface, but sometimes that cloud native um, portion for those backup and that recovery is, uh, is gonna serve the need. And so just gotta make sure that you're still defining what your you know RPOs and RTOs are going to look like when it comes time to taking and building that out. And uh, Crystal, it looks like we've actually got a question that came in here. And so this question's in from Merle. Merle, thank you so much for yeah, the, for that question. And so Merle's question is: uh, Does using on-prem 
and cloud backup solutions require different procedures and different RTOs? Well, fantastic question. We we're actually just talking about that. So it's uh, very fortuitous that you take <laughs> and you ask that same question right now as we're going through this. Um, yeah, like one of my big, big pieces that I'm a stickler for is uh, policy and procedure. And not only that, I'll use the word crystal operationalization for my teams. I find that we live in a world, and I'm a Microsoft uh, consultant. I've lived in the Microsoft space for 20 plus years. So have you. We've classically trained our administrators to right click on almost everything through the UI. And we are doing a very good job of like documenting that process um, on prem. Mm -hmm. Now cloud comes, it's almost impossible to fully document cloud based solutions in regards to policy and procedure guides. And the reason for that is, is that the UI can actually um, change right out from underneath you. You nicely documented something and now it's changing. Like the, if, if you guys have ever been, like you're listening to this presentation right now and just a virtual show of hands, you're going to look funny at your desk or if you're at home working from home, your kids are going to be like, why are you putting your hand up? <laughs> <laughs> um, but a, a show of hands here for those of you that um, have been in some type of cloud UI and go in there and then the next week it's changed. And so all the time, those, those, all the, it's like, well, we've added new features and now I can't find half the stuff I used to know where it was. Or, or there was some type of critical vulnerability in this yeah, particular so we, tool set. So we plugged the hole for yeah, you. Now you go, go now, figure it out. <laughs> now, now, now you go, now you go deal with it. It's like, um, this worked last week. Why isn't this working now? And uh, it, it's actually very challenging for our, uh, our backup providers that we have, those third parties that are out there, because they, they're they at the mercy of those APIs and the backend hooks to get into this. Um, and so they're, they're having to really hustle to keep up with that as well. Yeah, and that's why I say you need to know who to call, when to call, how to call. Yeah. Those are, because it's, just because it's changed for you, um, there should be someone on their end that knows where to find what you need. So yes, it does keep changing, but they should be keeping up on their end and don't be afraid to ask for help. When you're in those positions, don't be afraid to ask for your vendor's help. Absolutely. All right, so just a quick discussion here, Crystal, around this hybrid um, backup and recovery options. And so, I'm, I'm, I remember when we went to some sessions and they're like, hybrid's dead, everything's going all cloud. <laughs> and we all sat there going, mm, I don't think so. Yeah, and then the next sessions the next year, we're moving your data back from the cloud. <laughs> <laughs> how, to, how to create a secure hybrid environment. And uh, yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. And I, and I think the hybrid play is, is, is still, it's still a kind of a work, of, a work in progress. Um, it's come a long way. There's so many things you can do from the native Azure portal managing your um, on-prem infrastructure, for example, through Azure Arc. There's a lot of capabilities that Microsoft is extending um, backwards. But when it when it comes time to the the guts of protecting hybrid infrastructure, and for me, hybrid is a very simple concept. Um, the concept is I have some servers at a physical location that I touch and I have some servers that live up in the cloud. And so the big piece of this to remember is that whatever tooling it is that you're using, if you're using multiple tool sets between cloud and on-prem, that's fine, but just make sure that you're updating all of your documentation that goes along with this, because that documentation is a hard requirement now for a lot of those cyber insurance policies. If you want to get rate discounts, they're going to say, okay, you tell me that you have a hybrid backup and recovery and DR plan. You tell me that you can get, you know, up to 30, 90, 120 years worth of data back, prove it. And so this has actually started to come forth is that there's audits, inline audits of what you're answering on those questionnaires that can come forth from those cyber insurance vendors. And so backup and recovery is a big part of that crystal. And so the other thing that they're asking for is they're like, okay, we understand that you have the technical tools in place, but do you have the people power to support this plan 
that you are about to set forth. When you have your ransomware incident, do you have an incident response plan? Do you have a business continuity plan that's dedicated for cyber recovery? Do you have a business continuity plan that spans both hybrid and all your peer cloud infrastructure? And so these are really big pieces to think about is that, you know, just swapping or changing that solution that you've got for backing up, you could have a lot of backend documentation that you now have to catch up on as well. Because it's back to that same story. It's like the business comes to you and says, well, we don't really have the money to spend on backup and recovery mm -hmm. until they need it, mm -hmm. until there's an incident. And that's when you have that discussion again, Crystal, that, well, if you would have told me that this was so important, we would have dedicated more resources. If you just would have told me that you needed some help to get this done, we would have we would have sent we would have sent everybody in that you needed. Because we all know it's so easy to get IT budgets. Like everybody wants to throw money at IT. That's just the uh, the favorite thing for management to do. It's it is it's very important ahead of time to just we'll reiterate that over and over to make sure that management understands the importance of your backup and recovery to the cost of the business and business loss, should you not have it set and efficient. Um, we got another question that came in. Merle's actually asked a very good question here. And Merle, thank you for uh, participating and asking these questions. It's great for the session here. And the question is, uh, would you typically see different backup teams for on-prem versus cloud infrastructure? Yes, and it very much depends on the size of the organization, um, the amount of data you're protecting, and what what type of infrastructure team you have access to. You're right, because your cloud infrastructure could be outsourced. Your on-prem infrastructure that you're looking after could be insourced through your, your dedicated team and your app support team. Um, I just want to really caution everybody about something from a cloud perspective. We just sometimes forget that the cloud is up there and running. Cloud needs care and feeding as well. And so I was actually working with a customer this morning and the server support and infrastructure teams that were looking after everything um, were in charge of a couple pieces. They were in charge of backup and recovery, which was great. We went and checked that today and definitely we were green lights across the board in the Azure Backup Center. All the backups were taking place. And I was, and I looked at their their console. I said, well, "Okay, well, why don't we just pop into Defender Cloud here and let's see if, um, from a cyber perspective, if we're aligned? Because I don't want to leave holes in our cloud infrastructure." Well, as it turns out, they had a trial. As it turns out, the trial had expired. Oof. There was a one button that was in there, Crystal, that said, "Activate your subscription." So they were actually left without protection inside of there. And so my point to this is, is that the care and feeding from a cloud perspective is there the same way as you have for on-prem, um, but you really need to watch those pieces because who set it up, who's responsible. Um, at the end of the day, you know, when we traditionally set up infrastructure, we would have a networking support team. There would be a lead and then there would be secondary that, that supported that. SQL support teams, server support teams, application support teams. And if you're a smaller organization, you're all of the above. Yeah. And so you need to add this to your checklist to make sure that if you are a smaller organization, make sure that you're actually going through those portals and, and that you're if you've turned something on, make sure it's still working because you may have just activated it in a trial and you don't want to be there. If you have the manpower, a cloud administrator is, is excellent to have and have them trained on how to do the recovery. Oftentimes, as much as we would love to have separate teams do, working on both, checking both, often in especially smaller organizations, that is one person, many hats. Absolutely. All right, so to this discussion that we just had about turning on your all of your defenses, um, we have specific projects that we're spinning up inside of a lot of organizations, Crystal, and we call them the Shields Up um, initiatives. And so Shields Up is basically taking a look at all of the defenses that we have readily available to us through our existing providers that we have, not going to look at outsourcing or buying further tooling. 
Um, right now, as it stands, from a security standpoint, um, nobody is really getting fired for implementing Microsoft security products and platforms. They're ranking very high in Gartner, um, getting very good reviews. They're um, outsourced security operations centers and threat experts that you can purchase additional services for are fantastic. And so it's kind of like the old the old topic of IBM back in the day. Nobody got fired for putting in the big iron IBM solutions. Now it's kind of, this is where Microsoft is going because they can capture the entire picture, right? Because if it's your cloud infrastructure, they probably have your authentication up in there and your identity in Azure Active Directory. They've got pieces of your infrastructure. They can run the same security tooling on-prem as in the cloud and they can unify those interfaces. And so along those lines, um, one of the things that I want you to take away from this summit here today is not to be a victim of the next, next finish, okay? Because you can install Linux, you can install Windows, and quite literally, you can just pop in the ISO or boot from the USB, and I call it next, next, next finish, and you pretty much have an operating system after that. But is it hardened? Is it locked down? Is it to industry best standards? Is it to security best standards? Will it pass the pen test? Will it pass an audit? It's the 80-20 rule. It'll get you 80% of the way there. And now you have to do the other 20% to make sure that you are secure. Absolutely, and so along those lines, um, Microsoft has a deep partnership right now with the Center for Internet Security Crystal. And to the point that they've actually integrated the vulnerability scanning and assessment engines that were originally put in from the Center, Net, Center for Internet Security um, right inside of their Defender Advanced Threat Protection suite of products. So you can actually get baseline assessments to see how you're stacking up. And even better than that, both Microsoft and the Center for Internet Security provide you with templates for locking down and hardening your environment. So if you're using something like Microsoft Endpoint Manager, formerly known as Intune, to manage your desktops, they've got templates that will help you lock all that down. They've got security baselines that'll help you lock all of that down. Remove that next, next finish. Don't become the easy, low-hanging fruit for the threat actors that are out there. Um, in, the same, in the same mindset, we can lock down with Center for Internet Security Level 1 um, templates. They're called, um, they're called the, their baselines uh, or benchmarks um, very easily because they provide us the template GPOs. Now, you need, to t you need to test those, but there's over 300 settings in Level 1 that CIS recommends you change in a build of Windows Server 2019. Over 300 things that if you next, next finished, None of those are configured. And so Microsoft is providing, Center Net for Internet Security is providing vehicles for you to lock down this infrastructure. So instead of starting insecure and getting secure, you start secure. Mm -hmm. To further that point, if you build Microsoft Azure virtual machines, you select virtual machines from the gallery, you can now select pre-hardened images that are pre-hardened with either CIS or other industry standards so that when that virtual machine spins up, it is not a black hole. It's not sitting there wide open on your network because if that sits there wide open on the network, even for a minute, if something is inside of your, your perimeter, um, that thing could get attacked very quickly. And so when we look at this from a backup and recovery perspective, Crystal, backup targets are kind of like the holy grail for threat actors because when they ransom you, they don't want you to have the ability to recover. And, and I want to say that that's something that has actually really evolved in the ransomware. When we first started dealing with ransomware, that was the go-to fix. Just go grab your backup, wipe it out, rebuild, get it up and running. Uh, ransomware threat actors got smarter and they started getting in and staying quiet. And the reason they were doing that was because they were going and they were tracing and they were finding your backups and they were attacking those backups first. They were setting the stage so that by the time you know they're there, your backups are gone. 
So that is something that we really saw evolve over the last two years, where they were getting way smarter and coming after your backup first, whether it be to take the data or just to block you from being able to rebuild. That became, like, like you said, the holy grail that these threat actors were after. Absolutely, absolutely. And one, uh, so 2023, if you haven't heard of this concept yet, um, it's called the fabric, okay? And the, the general concept of a fabric in regards to protecting your backup targets as a critical asset inside of your infrastructure goes a little like this. For the past 20 years, we've strived for the utopia in the Windows world of trying to consolidate down to a single domain, a single namespace for ease of management, ease of maintenance, ease of, you know, configuration. So, you know, we're, we're kind of victims of our own success because now we dumped all of our backup targets inside of that primary domain that we have. Now we have a domain admin level breach. Guess what they've got access to? They've got now access to all of your backup targets. So simply put, what a fabric is, is an isolated, ultra-secure, hardened, Active Directory forced and domain that's dedicated for your backup target infrastructure and your backup infrastructure. And I've seen customers take this next level. So they'll actually move out their hypervisors out to one fabric. They'll move out their backup targets out to another fabric. And they'll run their infrastructure, their primary domain, on top. Right? Brilliant. Right? It's, it's in the same similar concept of what you have with cloud. Mm -hmm. Right? So in the cloud, you're really running. Like when you manage your virtual machines in Azure, you don't have access to the backend hosts that are actually driving that infrastructure. You're running on a fabric. Microsoft's fabric is called Azure, right? We just build that at smaller scale to help try to protect and defend against modern threat actors coming through. Now, you still have to lock all that down. We recommend no internet access inside of there. We recommend um, limiting the use of remote desktop protocol, RDP, or we call it the ransomware deployment protocol, um, multi-factor everything, and highly secured, highly audited environments. And just because you set that up, it doesn't mean that all your domain admins that are part of the primary domain need access into there. So a limited subset of administrators have access to that environment. You can always enable, enable the admins when they need to get in there and then remove them when they don't as well. Absolutely. Um, okay, so let's, let's think into the future here a little bit, Crystal, as to what um, this is going to look like for us. You know, for the past forever, as far as I can remember, we've been setting up block-based storage appliances. And so those block-based appliances would typically run some type of software-defined storage, some type of RAID configuration, and it would just be big blobs of data that we would we would be um, dumping our infrastructure onto. The the nice thing is is like the size of drives now. You get like 18, 20 terabyte drives for spinning disk to store this on to park your data on. But that's kind of the old way of looking at this. And so the new way of looking at this is moving away from that traditional block based storage. You can now get object based storage appliances that are automatically configured with tiering up to the cloud. And, you know, that object-based storage, I, I think that, you know, we had the question in the previous session around um, some intelligence with AI and integrating that into, you know, some of your backup and recovery strategies. It, moving to object-based storage starts to allow some of those pieces to happen. Um, and so, anyways, yeah, we should be looking at this. So We had another question here, too, I just realized. Uh, would you use a federated authentication service for on-prem and cloud access? Um, so, so that would depend. So, if is like for your cloud access, one of the things that we recommend for both on-prem and cloud access from um, an identity perspective is, and this is really hard for administrators, Crystal, is the concept of multiple identities. And, you know, your principles of, of, um, of least privilege, your principles of zero trust, where, and, and I'm just, I'm just going to walk through this because we still have a few minutes here. Um, the, the concept of zero trust, and this is a big one. By default, when you build a Windows domain crystal, the domain administrators group is a member of every single workstation as an administrator, is a member of every single server. Well, as it turns out, the only requirement for a domain administrator is to actually manage a domain controller. That was set up as total ease of use. 
And so you have to set up tiering for those accounts. So for example, a domain administrator only needs to log into a domain controller, does not log into a server, does not log into a workstation. A workstation admin will only log into a server, won't log into a domain controller or a desktop. And a desktop admin account will only log into a desktop, not to servers or to your domain controllers. Moving that forward, um, local admin password solution, randomizing those passwords on a per end device basis for the local administrator accounts. Um, and it, what it makes is it makes this a little bit tricky for federated authentication when we're dealing with our on-prem and cloud environments, because now it's like, okay, we've got cloud, but how do I delineate and distinguish all of those different cloud-based roles? Well, the good news is, is the cloud is actually a lot more mature from a role-based access perspective and one of the things that you should be looking at, Merle, is uh, a piece called uh, privilege identity management. And so what it'll do is it'll elevate you to the roles that you need for a period of time that goes through an approval chain, and then it'll take those rights away from you, right? And so I always equate that to me, Dave, the contractor. Um, I don't want dormant high-privileged accounts hanging around, either delete my access or disable my accounts. I don't want somebody jumping in through my rights getting in there. But you don't want to be that doorway, that access pathway, right? Exactly. And that's where I'm saying you give access when needed, and you can pull it back when not. And that that is just one more step to securing your environment. Yeah, and, and just further to, further to that point about the federated authentication, I think it's having that universal account that's going to work for both on-prem and cloud. Yes, we do see that in a lot of environments where those accounts, those um, server admin accounts are going to be good for your cloud-based infrastructure, going to be good for you know your on-prem infrastructure. You just have to see how far you really want to take that. Though. All right, so next one here. Um, immutability, Crystal. Um, so immutability is a big one. And so when we take a look at um, immutability, this one here is, is huge from, um, from my perspective because when we look at uh, immutability, this is that real protection against ransomware. This is that protection against your um, threat actors. So the good news is, is that most cloud vendors now support immutability for your blob storage. Mm -hmm. And so immutability is a funny word for me because you and I have been around for a very long time in the IT industry. We're going to date ourselves. We're the, we're the old, we're the old dogs in the room now. <laughs> and so, you know, back in the day, you used to have floppy disks. And if you don't know what those are, you can go Google them. But basically, it was it was a form of storage that we had back in the day where you had a little tab on the top of it, and you could write protect that. So your most critical documents, as you're transporting them around, you couldn't accidentally overwrite them. Well, this is immutability, okay? It's write once, read many. That's what immutability is. And immutability can come at multiple levels. Immutability could come at the storage level, um, the software level, at the cloud level, at the hardware level. It can come at very many different levels, but at the end of the day, it does the same thing. So if you did get breached or attacked and somebody did get access to your data, they couldn't modify or manipulate that data for a set fixed period of time, be it a week, be it two weeks, be it a month, it's all configurable for you. And so what that means is that as long as you still have access to that information, you're kind of good to go. Now where you really get yourselves into trouble is when you have a cloud-based breach where somebody has full global admin rights, um, your backups are the least of your worries because the delete button is functionally available on everything. And I hope you had really good documentation as to how all of that was pinned up because there might not be just a global restore button to bring all of those hooks back in. Because for example, I'll give you a great example here, Crystal. This is one of the gaps from a cloud perspective, okay? So let's just say hypothetically, I went through the UI and I created all of my virtual networks up on the cloud. Well, there's no backup button in Azure to say backup my virtual networks. If you delete them, they're gone, okay? And so- I feel like I can virtually hear everybody's heartbeat speeding up as you're talking. Best be documenting <laughs> all of that and the, even the better solution is maybe you should have PowerShell that up there or you know scripted that up there in the first place 
because if you had scripted that up there in the first place, then at least you've got something to fall back on if it does all fall down in front of you. All right, um, next one, um, migrating to new hardware. Um, Remember we had that point earlier in the presentation, Crystal, about um, having old backups and storage targets that are out there off warranty impacting your cyber insurance claims. Now, um, the good news is the supply chain is improving. We're not waiting typically a year to get servers anymore. Throughout, right now. Throughout 2022, um, I actually just had a customer that had some Lenovo infrastructure delivered, and I'm not picking on Lenovo because every vendor just has happened the same to be problem. Lenovo for these guys. And so, yeah, February 2022, hardware ordered, uh, hardware delivered January 2023. 11 months later, hardware showed up. And so, yeah, so you better plan ahead if you're going to be ordering hardware, number one. Number two is because hardware is kind of hard to come by right now, um, I do have a recommendation for your designs, both Crystal and I do, which is to um, keep that old hardware. Yeah. Take it off the network because it's as long as it's off the network, and we said earlier don't be a data hoarder, but you might want to be a server hoarder for 2023, at least until we see where the supply chain thing pans out. Because in the event that you have a breach, in the event that you need to do a mass recovery and you need hardware, you can't just snap your fingers and make it readily available for you. So you need to make sure that you're accurately prepared Once upon a time, you could overnight hardware yeah. to the door and you'd be back up and rebuilding within 24 hours. Now you might have to go back, blow the dust off the old hardware, that end of life, just so that you can get it back up and running. Now, we don't recommend staying on that hardware, but sometimes keeping that hardware as an emergency, it's like having a spare set of keys just hanging on the wall that you're, you know, you only use when you cannot access your other keys, like they're locked away. It's, it's the same concept, just having it there as an emergency um, use, not something that we recommend continuing to run on but at least it gives you hardware that you can use quickly when needed. Yeah, and I've got a point in here about upgrading network because um, we're dealing with some customers right now. We do a lot of work in the manufacturing sector and a lot of that infrastructure that's out there, believe it or not, it's still old 100, gig, uh, 100 meg switches that are being upgraded. The big forklift for them years ago was going to gig infrastructure. Mm -hmm. um, when you're talking about recoverability in the event of cyber and threats, um, they're, they're happening. Boom. You just got hit right now, Crystal. Right now, you just got hit. And what does that mean for you? You need to go wipe and reload all your desktops. But you're going to push that all over, you know, gig infrastructure. You're going to be hammering that network for a good period of time. As part of your upgrades, consider upgrading your core network infrastructure and your edge or leaf span switches that you've got out there to getting more back and back end back plane and backbone um, speed inside of there. So that upgrade for you to move from one gig to 10, 25, or even 100 is way more cost effective than what it was five years ago. Add that into the mix because as part of your recovery plan, we've now forklifted and upgraded our back-end network infrastructure. So the amount of time to physically move data from A to B is way less. Well, not to mention most of the stuff that's shipping nowadays is shipping with those 100 gig plus cards. You may as well leverage that when you're using your network. Why Why have, you know, a, a gig network on with connecting 200 gig service? It just doesn't make physical sense anymore. Absolutely, absolutely. And we talked a little bit about the backup targets, keeping your old backup targets. Everything's gone one Monday morning. This is what happens. Cyber insurance vendors come in. Forensic auditors are in there. Don't touch anything. We need to figure out where it came from. Well, that could take two to three weeks of your systems being down. But you could be restoring and rebuilding Greenfield on those old backup targets to get your payroll, accounting, critical systems, backup and running, invoicing, whatever it takes to get you up and running. And one of the thought processes that you have to go through with your organizations is, what if we're dark? What if there's nothing today? Can this plant still operate? Can this lab still operate? Can we still open the doors? Can we still answer the phones? Can what does this pay our look people? like? Exactly. And so that's the process that you've got to go through for 2023. But do keep that old infrastructure because that could be the magic pill that you can swallow that will get you out of a really tough situation um, in the event that you're in one. 
I was about one final piece here, Crystal, before we're going to wrap up because we have a couple more minutes here. Um, and this is um, we've seen a, a wide range of uh, carrier failures, telco failures, backbone failures in 2022 with a lot of our customers that we've supported. And it could be an entire geographic region. It could be due to a natural disaster. It could be due to a variety of reasons. Well, just in the beginning here, we put such a strain on on our telecoms and everything yep. when we had a, that quick shift to everybody working from home that that alone caused outages like crazy. Absolutely. And so, so one of the things I want you to consider is an RDSN network. And so the RDSN network is what we call a rapidly deployable secure network. So in the event that you have some type of a carrier failure, let's say that your mission is to bring that plant operation back online so that the robotic cells can keep going, so that you can get the labs up and running, so that the analyzers can keep going. Well, this was actually a design that was brought forth from, um, from the, actually the war in Ukraine. And so there was a lot of infrastructure, core infrastructure that was taken out, and Starlink was actually powering the entire country to get things back up and running. So we were thinking that, okay, well, why couldn't this also be a cyber defense strategy for corporations as well? Because if you've never seen, for example, and I'm not picking Starlink as a vendor, I'm just using this as an example, you can take a Starlink out of box and get connected to the internet quite literally in five minutes. And so that rapidly deployable network with location rehoming that they offer, you can go pop that outside of the plant, run a cable in, and you can get back up and running. Think of a fiber cut crystal. If you had a fiber cut, now all of a sudden that plant is effectively down. Are you going to move everything over to DR? Or do you want to think about something like an RDSN solution? We, we actually have a client who has boxed one of these solutions up, and it's literally just the moment something happens, pull it out, stick that post into the box, get that satellite up and ready, and you're ready to go. It's set and ready to go because it's that important that their operations keep going. And maybe that RDSN means you don't even need your backup and recovery environment because you got yourself back online. So it's just something kind of cool that we wanted to bring up ending our presentation with here. And uh, for us, unfortunately, Crystal, our time is up. And so we took some questions during the session. Um, everyone that's attended, thank you very much. We really appreciate um, your participation here. And we're going to hand it back over to uh, to John to move on to the next session. There'll be a brief break here. And, uh, and you know what? Have fun with the rest of the day, everyone. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Dave and Crystal, for another great session. I think you guys might be my, my favorite d dynamic duo. Well, thank you very much, John. Oh. We really appreciate it. <laughs>